Welcome, everybody. Um, we're so excited to have Marissa here. We um, transition aging as part of our transition point program. That's uh, our transition point program that looks across the lifespan of an individual with a disability, from early intervention through special ed, um, through uh, transitioning out of school to employment, housing, and then finally aging. And so we're so excited to have you here as part of the aging. That is a population that we feel needs a lot of support, and we need to provide more information. To done that as much as we would like to, so we're so happy to have Marissa here today. Um, Marissa Brown is retired from the faculty of the Georgetown University Center for Child and Human Development, University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities in Washington, D.C., and she specializes in health care of individuals with IDDD and has over 30 years, 38 years of experience, and she's a parent herself of a child with a disability. So, um, so I want to thank you for being here. Um, the people on the webinar, if you have questions, um, we have a chat box you'll see to the left side of your screen, so just type in the questions to the chat box and I will um, raise it to Marissa, okay? All right. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me. Um, and one of the things that, we, uh, that I want to do at the outset for people on the webinar, we already have, I wanted to make sure that if there are any kind of burning issues that you have, that I spend sufficient time on that. So we already have. So you on the webinar can um, put your question into the chat room, um, but we already have one question around how do you differentiate changes that the person may <laughs> The conference has been muted. We will be covering that. <clears throat> the other thing is that um, I would like to save uh, questions more to the end, however, I'm a firm believer that if you have, this is, it tells you about how I learn to think. If you've got something that is really like stuck there and you can't move on and you can't pay attention, could just please raise your hand and we'll address it at the time, okay? Because I want to make this useful and there is a lot of material and. The conference has been muted. Finish everything, I will, uh, I'll come back again <laughs> if you would willing to come back too. So I think to put something in context is that uh, dementia is a national health problem uh, and was recognized uh, by Congress in 2014. And there was a group of people, really dedicated <coughs> DD professionals, who said we've got to make sure that people with developmental disabilities are really a part of this because there's always that tug and pull about well, of course, all means all. If you remember, we used to, that was one of our big advocacy issues in special education, all means all, but then sometimes people with disabilities historically get left behind and people don't really think about it. So they wanted to make sure that there was language directly related to people with developmental disabilities within this report. So this group of people, a lot of it on kind of volunteer time, got busy and they're, they come under the umbrella of the American Association of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And Diane said, I sent Diane some links because I think that, uh, particularly for the professionals in the group, um, some of these uh, documents such as My Thinker's Not Working, which is a great report. The title came from a young man with Down syndrome himself who had been diagnosed with dementia. And that's how he described his condition, which they thought was a really a good way to kind of put in what they are thinking about. They've developed some practice guidelines that I think are really essential, have great information about how to support someone with dementia. And they also have, and we'll spend some time talking about their screening report. Now, these slides, this material is from the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia. And a couple of years ago, I participated in their training to become a regional trainer. So it is something that was always of interest to me because my grandmother, who I was 
raised in her home, she um, uh, had dementia, and so I had a lot of up close and personal with how that affected her. I now have two friends in their 60s with dementia, a very close friend of mine who um, is, you know, struggling uh, with, uh, with this whole uh, disruption to your life. But these uh, guidelines, I think, are really important and, you know, it tells you how boring person I am. This is the kind of stuff, though, that you really, you really should read. Uh, it's going to be so helpful. Um, the thinkers document talked about some things that when I talk to uh, kind of professional groups, I always like to use this as a report card. And you could do this for your own service organization. What are you doing? Um, is there early screening across the lifespan? Um, because we do now have a screening tool specifically for people with ID. Uh, is that used? I'm going to predict that by the end of this session, you're going to know more about dementia and how it impacts people with ID than most neurologists, including those neurologists who treat a lot of people with epilepsy. They don't know this information. And so we'll talk about health advocacy. I imagine since you all are here physically and participating on the webinar, you're all advocates uh, anyway. And uh, I guess the advocacy never ends, right? We're just going to have to keep being advocates. Um, it's a real interesting intersection, obviously, as the as your son and daughter with a disability are aging, we're aging too. So there can be that intersection of um, it may be the person with the disability that we're talking about that has um, a dementia, but it could also be the caregivers. And what does that mean when, and in my professional experience, we've had the situation of the person who's been the authorized representative for their son and daughter, all of a sudden, they're harder to reach. They're not wanting to make some of the decisions that need to be made. Like people are thinking, what's up? And it may be that the caregiver now has dementia. And what, how do we approach that? So it's, it's um, a really uh, difficult intersection. Uh, what we're doing today, we have to do a lot more uh, education for the community. This is an answer a question kind of for the CSDs here in Virginia. What are you doing to support that? I'm going to reflect that. Again, in Washington, D.C., yes, we had a lawsuit that went on forever and ever. Um, they only serve, the only people eligible in the District of Columbia for their services um, under what would be the CSB are people with intellectual disability. So they're not supporting people like my son who has autism at mental health problems, not intellectual disability. So as a result of that, they don't have a waiting list. The good part of that is if you have an intellectual disability, that's a, I mean, that's a, um, I'll just keep going. I'm so sorry. That's all right. I feel like I'm at home being interrupted all the time. So, uh, it makes me feel at home. Um, so in D.C., there is any number of supports that as the person requires more support, they're even getting one-on-one -on -one services. So I do think that that, though, in most of the country, that becomes a conundrum about how many supports are you really getting? Uh, and will is the system flexible enough to be able to give you those supports when the time changes. So um, if Virginia is really good at doing that, you know, let me know. But that certainly could be a problem in terms of what do we understand and what is our philosophy around a person still maintaining independence, community placement, things like aging in place uh, are a real consideration um, in terms of, you know, what are the stairs, uh, you know, what's the physical setup of the home? Uh, and then do you go on safety? Um, you know, this person, uh, maybe we should move them to a place that is more dementia, entirely dementia capable, but then they have to move away from their friends and housemates. So this whole thing around community supports really does require a lot of discussion so that we have a sense of, you know, what are our values and can we put our money where our mouth is? 
Um, research is very difficult, you know, in this area because when you're and having competed for some kind of federal dollars in my working career, uh, you're competing um, in a very competitive market of other researchers. And then on top of it, we're talking about a tiny population. So it's really hard to get good research money um, to be able to track some of these things. We talked about healthcare advocacy. Collaboration across networks is going to be so important. I'm so glad to see people here from the Department of Health because that's exactly the thing that we'll be talking about, looking outside of just our DD networks for some help in this area. Uh, we talked a little bit about long-term planning. It's going to require, you know, people from the CSB here in the county, um, also looking at what does the state have to do and are we, uh, you know, fitting in with resources that may be available on a national basis. And again, that need for our service providers to think about their teams as dementia capable, because it really does require a pivot from how we typically think about always wanting to introduce new learning things for all of ourselves, right? We're all, we like to think of ourselves, we should think of ourselves as lifelong learners. Uh, for pe a person with dementia, things really do pivot at that point. So Albert, just a little kind of a context, uh, here's a gentleman who's uh, in his 60s, lived with his parents and an extended family till 1992. Uh, we know that people uh, increasingly all over the United States with disabilities are living in their family home. And we as family members <clears throat> are providing the bulk of supports to our family members. Um, when his mother died, he, had, he moved in with his aunts until it became too difficult for them to care for him, and then moved into a group home. And about 11 years later, they started noticing changes. And it took about a year before he got his formal diagnosis. And that's one thing to remember in the diagnosis of dementia, even though I do think the screening tool gives us some really valuable information, we do have a much better sense of what should be done when in terms of diagnosis. It still isn't, that it's not something like, you know, you go in, you get your blood take drawn. Mm -hmm. If your hemoglobin A1C is high, you get a diagnosis of diabetes or blood pressure. There are all these metrics now in healthcare that kind of tell you you do or you don't. With dementia, it's going to be more of a, it is a ruling out process and it's going to take some time to figure that out. So we should think about a little bit about aging because, you know, what is aging? Uh, what does it mean to us? It could have different meanings uh, culturally. Um, it's really unique to each person in terms of who feels older, who doesn't. It's also um, really driven a lot by genetics. Um, it's kind of hard to escape your genetics um, in terms of your risk for certain, you know, diseases like high cholesterol, high blood pressure. And then your lifestyle. Um, you know, we're uh, mourning the loss of Barbara Bush today, and uh, one of the things apparently she said, uh, I'll help my husband do anything for his election except uh, change my wardrobe, dye my hair, or lose weight. <laughs> and, you know, that, that candor is why so many people love Barbara Bush, whether you liked her husband's politics or not. And, um, and she lived to be 92. I should be so lucky. But, um, but you know, maybe if she had been a little, you know, paid attention to her weight, what would it have been? Mm -hmm. Lifestyle does impact. It, and that's a really hard one to take because we all think that we're living the life we want. And so when somebody tells you, you know, maybe you shouldn't drink a glass of wine every day because that's an extra couple hundred calories. Or, you know, you, you just... We make decisions. So lifestyle is important in terms of aging. Our environment um, for people who were who spent a long time uh, in institutional care that that has um, uh, a direct impact. You know, people picked up a lot of hepatitis uh, at that time, or your lifestyle if you were kind of living the high life out in the community, and uh, perhaps you were high life isn't the right word. But because maybe you were involved with substance abuse or alcohol abuse. Um, are you a person who has been traumatized? Are you a person who has been uh, abused? All of these things fit in. And then finally, our attitude. So we can at least think 
younger? Do we look in the mirror and think, I don't know who that person is in the mirror, but I don't feel really much different than I did 30, 40 years ago. I feel like I did when I was in college. Um, so all those things impact aging, and they're different for people with intellectual disabilities. So we, we know that this, um, these factors impact, but it's never too late to make a difference. So this is where, uh, especially for those of you who are providing professional services, what you have to really imbue to your staff around, you know, what are we here for? Are we here just to kind of monitor and babysit, or are we here to try to model a lifestyle, um, model some creativity, excitement, and things, things really moving and shaking? Because I do believe, we don't have hard data about this, but um, that a lot of what we can impart to direct support staff. So, um, you know, around, I'll use an example around toothbrushing uh, and going to the dentist. Uh, in D.C., we had wonderful Medicaid um, benefits, so people were able to get comprehensive dental services. But one of the things that didn't happen was it was a heck of a thing to get people to brush their teeth, which is really even more important than being able to go see a dentist. But if the staff themselves don't really take very good care of their teeth and don't go to the dentist, it, it becomes a barrier. So. Um, we really do have to help people recognize that even if you did, you know, some things that weren't so great for your health in the past, it really is never too late to make, to make some changes. Um, so we've talked about some of these things already about um, even health practices. When we think about, we know that the lifespan of people with intellectual disabilities is increasing. Um, even for people with Down syndrome who still have a, um, a earlier, uh, uh, earlier occurrence of death. People with autism, things aren't looking so good for them. They're starting to see that people with <coughs> autism, um, God bless you, probably because of some of their um, behavioral practices, are not doing so well in terms of getting longer lives. So it's a mixed, uh, it's a mixed bag. Some of it can be because maybe they had trouble accessing good health care, or people aren't paying attention um, to things that are important like colorectal cancer screening. Um, I was doing some reviews in, in part of the state this, uh, two weeks ago and found a couple of people well past 50 who didn't have any colorectal mm -hmm. cancer screening done. So, um, those kind of preventive health practices are really important. Um, Long-term consequences of therapeutic interventions, I would say not just therapeutic and post-polio, that's a whole um, physical thing that happens. It definitely impacts people with cerebral palsy. We know that people with cerebral palsy, especially significant cerebral palsy, where they may not be ambulatory, they often do become, begin to have swallowing problems and then may have to go to um, uh, nutrition through uh, a tube in their stomach. And then people with long-term medication use, so Thorazine. Um, Thorazine, they should be screened for signs of what they call tardive dyskinesia or like a movement disorder. Sometimes that screening isn't always helpful, and then even when it is detected, uh, and you stop the Thorazine, for example, if that's what was causing the, um, the tremors, if the tardive dyskinesia is there, it's not going to go away. And so how does that impact the person? That could impact their ability to get around independently. Uh, it could increase the risk of falls. We know that when people fall and they're aged, it's not a good predictor in terms of lifespan. Um, and again, swallowing can become a problem. So all of these factors impact um, healthy living. Uh, we're going to be talking certainly about dementia, lack of exercise. There have been a lot of studies that show people with disabilities don't get the exercise that's recommended. Um, I can use my son for an example. We have to sit on him to get him to move. He's perfectly happy doing Nothing, and I've had to really make my peace with this because, has, uh, you know, I feel like I've been a lifelong advocate of people with disabilities getting out in the community, enjoying life, and doing all these things. And now I see my son, who's now 36. Man, I have to sit 
from him to get him to do almost everything. So um, it's going to impact our, our life. Uh, poor nutrition. Um, again, we want to promote people's independence and your food choices, but what happens when a person is really choosing really bad things that are bad for them? That they're, you know, they're on a pathway to diabetes or they're, they already have diabetes and what is happening with it. So there are a lot of uh, challenges. Um, there are a lot of, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, I think you have this in your handouts. Your handouts, I should say, I pared down some of the things that are up here that really weren't important to your um, making your notes and jotting things down. But we do have a lot of uh, challenges. We already talked about the little research available. The lack of formal training in healthcare providers. I always think OTs and PTs must get more of it. Um, there is at least some light at the horizon. Uh, Special Olympics just put out uh, some uh, money. Georgetown is one of the people to get the money to actually do specific uh, training for their residents about the health needs of people with developmental disabilities. So it's kind of starting to happen, um, but it does, again, it's going to make you the expert in dementia and ID. Okay. The four most important things if you want to understand about dementia, and um, I apologize if you already know this, but I think this is important. So there is some loss in cognitive functioning at the age, but what we are talking about is that change in cognition that affects the person's daily life. So it's not like I left here today, I had to get my husband's spare set of keys for my car because I can't find my car keys. Now we have to hide my car keys, that's the whole thing around my son and what I keep locked up in my car and so I never know where my car keys are and so I couldn't find them today. So, but I don't think that has significantly impacted my function, although if my husband didn't find that spare key, I guess I was going to get his Uber ticket. <laughs> it could have, it was close, that was a close call. Mm -hmm. And then this is one that people get um, confused about and pretty soon I'll start talking about, when I say dementia, I am going to be talking about Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies, et cetera. But dementia actually is a set of symptoms. It's not necessarily, so you can get, we'll talk about it in a minute, you can exhibit dementia from things that are reversible. It's just a set of symptoms. So it doesn't mean necessarily that you already, you we're talking about Alzheimer's, but it is used interchangeably. So sometimes people say, ah, oh, thank goodness the doctor said I had uh, dementia, I thought I had Alzheimer's. Um, and I believe now they're starting to use minimal cognitive impairment. And for example, with my friend, I have to say I'm kind of angry that her neurologist for about three or four years used the, the diagnosis minimal cognitive impairment. When she first exhibited her symptoms, she's in her late 50s. She has, she has Alzheimer's dementia. And I feel that they kind of missed that opportunity to help her think and plan at a time where she could think and plan. Because now, well now, about a year and a half ago, she could tell me she had dementia. I was suspicious of it before because we worked closely together. But now she doesn't remember that she has dementia. So, and a lot of these things we're going to talk about what to do. I have to find myself like Marisa. Do what you tell people to do in class and stop like trying to explain to her, remember? Remember we talked about that? <laughs> she, she does not remember. So dementia is really a symptom, um, and in fact, there are several types of dementia of, that are not reversible. Um, so again, we want to, part of that diagnostic process is making sure we have ruled out things that are treatable, but it is not a part of normal aging. However, continuing to get older is the highest risk factor for dementia. So, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. This you have in your um, handout, and I think it's a great visualization that, again, dementia can um, include many things. So there is a vascular dementia that occurs uh, after a person has had a stroke because they've had damage to the blood flow in their brain and there's parts of their brain that aren't working anymore. I don't think we used to think about, we used to think that separately. Um, well, that was a stroke. That wasn't dementia. But again, once those parts of the brain have died, 
they're not coming back, and they're not going to regenerate because of the person's age. So those um, uh, memory problems that the person has, or even motor problems, it's not just memory, it's also some motor problems that a person will have, they're not going to be reversed. Um, people with Parkinson's disease, and there's a, I think, a, um, a wonderfully illustrative commercial right now on TV about a man who uh, has Parkinson's disease and he sees his wife with an, another man. And I think it does a great visualization of the paranoia that people have because his reality is, well, who's that man here with? And, um, so people who have Parkinson's disease, again, it's not 100%, but they are at very high risk of developing dementia as part of the progression of their disease. And then the frontotemporal dementia and Lewy body dementia um, are both very similar in that the kind of problems that they cause often behavioral problems. Again, because of the part of the brain that is typically affected. However, the most common form is the Alzheimer's type. So it counts for anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of people diagnosed with irreversible dementia have the Alzheimer's type. And um, I have a good friend who's going through with this diagnostic process right now. Her husband, only in his mid-60s, I think that's young, my perspective on the world, that's young these days. And um, they are going through and teasing through what type of dementia he has. And the reason it is important is because it does help you kind of prepare and understand. So. For the parents in the room, I don't know if you experience this, but to me, once my son was diagnosed and I could see these are the characteristics of people with autism, that really helped me out a lot. It like explains a lot of what they're doing and how we react to them and what you can change and what you can't change, right? It just kind of helps. So with I think with dementia and knowing the distinctions can help us to at least understand what is coming down the pipe. Uh, and probably more benefit for the caregiver and the support team than anybody else, okay? Um, the risk of dementia in people with intellectual disabilities, not Down syndrome, is the same as the general population. Um, however, people with Down syndrome tend to develop it at a younger age with a more rapid progression once it is developed. Um, so actually our recommendations, so one of the things we did in the District of Columbia is we put forward a set of standards of screening, including for dementia. And the nice thing was the government people, uh, you know, their equivalent of the CSB, put it into their monitoring expectations for providers. So there was a consequence of providers, so people went and monitored. Uh, we did a lot of education about, you know, what is dementia? Here are the tools for you. We made them available on a web page. And then also did monitoring to make sure that when a person was enrolled in a residential service provider, these things happened. So this was the expectation that people would be screened. So for people with Down syndrome, the screening was to, is supposed to start at age 40. Uh, for people with um, other intellectual and developmental disabilities, their screening only has to begin when there are some signs of it. So that's the standard. We'll go over that again. And this just shows you the, uh, the percentages. Again, um, people as young as 40 can have uh, dementia. It's a very low percent. Uh, it's still pretty low in, their, in your 60s before you're 80. So the fact that I know two people is, you know, it makes you think like this is a public health. Uh, mm -hmm. epidemic, uh, but even at over age 80, it, you're getting at 12 percent. And some of the epidemiology of that is well, people who might have developed dementia, they, if they died earlier from other causes, they kind of come off the grid there. But you see certainly in people with Down syndrome, 22 percent of people over 40, which is very high, and then 56 percent. Mm -hmm. But it's not 100 percent, so we have to remember that. There was some early uh, discussion when they first found the um, genes for Alzheimer's on the 21st chromosome, 
uh, it was put out that 100% of people down syndrome are going to get this because they have that third copy. Uh, so you may still run across people who think that, but that has been debunked, that that's not true. But of course, 56% is a lot higher than um, 6%, right? That certainly reaches mm -hmm. significant. Are you saying that Alzheimer's is hand in hand with dementia? Or is dementia something separate? No, no, no. Uh, Alzheimer's is a type of irreversible dementia. So dementia can be, we'll get into this in a minute, it can be a symptom of a vitamin deficiency. You could have dementia. Uh, it can be a problem with vision uh, that is correctable, but it makes people, sick. a person with a hearing loss can make somebody start thinking, I think they have dementia because my husband has a hearing loss, where is his hearing aids? And, but we do have these like confusions, like, did he hear me? I know I said something. Did he hear me? Why doesn't he remember that? Well, if I say something and I'm not looking at him with his hearing aid on, and we won't even get into his selective hearing, that's been married for 40 some years, and I talk a lot, I know. And, um, so, but sometimes you can be like, well, how did he miss that? Or why isn't he following along in a social situation and conversation? Well, if there's a lot of background, it, so a person with a hearing loss can mimic some signs of dementia. So when <coughs> now I'm going to get into talking about when I'm going to talk about dementia, I'm mostly going to talk about the irreversible type. And Alzheimer's is one type. Some of this distinction with the frontotemporal lobe and even the Parkinson's and the Lewy body is, I think, fairly new understanding of dementia and, and the types. We for a while we thought just everybody had Alzheimer's. Um, but we were interchanging terminology. So dementia is a symptom, but that little umbrella picture, these are all the types of irreversible dementia, one of them being Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's being that most common one. Okay. And again, remember, all of these are irreversible. So at some point, like, does it matter what kind you have? But it does help in understanding the behavioral consequences that you're going to see. Because, you know, we have trouble with behaviors anyway, right? <laughs> like, we all say behavior is communication. Mm -hmm. Like, we know we know this. But then when you're really right up against it, so I had an uncle <laughs> who developed dementia. I think he had Louis Body. Now, this was 20-some years ago. He was the most gentle, kindest person, had a lovely marriage with him. My aunt, she also developed dementia of Alzheimer's type, although she also had Parkinson's, so who knows. My uncle started... Like he, he, they went into some kind of assisted living together, and he started like running away from assisted living, going down this dangerous highway, walking to a bar to drink, and started fondling women. So in my family, everybody started saying, "Oh, he's doing that because you know he's been married to that awful woman all his life. He never said anything. Now he's breaking out, which was, which is not true." at all. He lost his ability to understand kind of what is okay and not okay to do. These were not long harboring nothing. It's just the part of his brain that was affected by, you know, by the changes brought on. So we really do struggle around behaviors and we want to, I don't know, assign all kinds of things. So there is still probably some people, I think, we have a much better understanding that may, have, may think that, well, people with intellectual disability, they just act different. Uh, and not recognizing what is perhaps a mental illness. We still have that in people with depression. Depression can cause acting out. Don't get me going on a lot, depends on what color you are. Do you have depression or are you lazy? Do you have depression or are you a criminal? So it depends on how you're treated. If you're not getting treatment for your depression, it could make you do things that you get arrested for. So that's for another day. I'll leave that to Starbucks. To deal with that one. So, uh, so our understanding of behavior uh, is is very important in this. Uh, remember, I told you we're going to kind of make ourselves pivot a little bit on how we understand even uh, future goals when a person's been diagnosed. So the good news is people with developmental disabilities, for the most part, are still having an increase in their lifespan. That is good. The negative part is that makes them at increased risk for dementia. 
so the people at the National Task Group are saying, we need to raise what we call the index of suspicion. And this is part of my goal today, is to get people to at least be thinking about when there are changes, could this be dementia? Let's start taking a look at it. Um, I want programs and services to become dementia capable. So I was working with an organization in DC and um, the person they were supporting already had diagnosis of dementia. And one of the things that he did that was really irritating, he was often up at night. Well, he had to wake overnight staff, so that shouldn't have been a problem. But he would take all his clothes out of his uh, closet every night and kind of leave them dumped. And they were, this really bothered and so, so again, you know, we expect, I know when I go and monitor homes, I look in the closet, I want to see if the person has a nice range of nice clothes to, to choose from. But for that guy, I was like, you know what, put a few things in his closet and then put the rest in a trunk. I would suggest you get a nice attractive, like, trunk that you could even leave in the living room that has kind of the rest of his wardrobe in it so that you're not, he still has something to mess with in the middle of the night, but you're not having to clean up 20 pairs of pants. You only have maybe five pairs of pants to clean up with. So there are things that we can do uh, to become dementia capable. How do we think about the supports? Again, from a, from a CSB standpoint, it's letting loose of that money to allow for higher hours of service. And I, don't, I really have no idea how easy that is to do here. Um, we know we have to improve diagnostic sources and we need even our case managers to understand this. I mean, again, lots of education to do. So these are some of the warning signs of, now we're talking about any of the irreversible dementias can have this, uh, these warning signs. Again, that memory loss, that, and that's the hard one because when people are early in their stages of dementia, they do a lot to cover up what's going on. So my good friend who I work with, she, she is anyway a very confident person. And, and if you're not on your game, you're going to lose an argument with her anyway. So she would start this stuff with either I didn't tell her or I was always wrong. Uh, and we remain good friends to this day. I see her every week. We do things together. But uh, I was always wrong. So I thought, all right, I'm going to start keeping a log because one of us has something going on. And it could have been me. Or, uh, because So I started doing that to just track. You know, like I told her such and such today. Uh, or, you know, we agreed to. And she was really good at covering it up. So good that I think before she stopped working, I think she came in a lot of times. and Because we were very independent in our work. We didn't have somebody, uh, you know, breathing down her neck every day. Like, these are five things that you have to get done at the end of the day. And so I really think she spent a lot of time just kind of looking at the computer and not really, and, and we did find out later that she would go to meetings but never participated in the meetings. So um, people are good at covering up things to protect their own ego. That's just kind of a natural thing. But So the memory loss is certainly a big one. Difficulty doing usual tasks. And this, is, this could be anything from a memory to um, the person may be seeing things differently. So uh, the person who always loved going to service source site or they always loved going to the rec center all of a sudden doesn't want to get in the van or the car. I remember one woman who uh, did, was not going to get in a bathtub or even go into the bathroom. It happened that her bathroom was on the second floor. There was no bathroom on the first floor. And the stairs were steep, it was an older home, and dark. We're going to talk in a little bit about what does that mean around what, you know, what we can do to help uh, a person kind of see things a little more clearly in the absence of shadows. So difficulty doing things that the person had always done before. Um, getting lost. So we have people who are independent on the metro, can walk around their neighborhood, they know where they are, and then now they're getting lost, or they took a long time. Uh, you, you went out to, to walk the dog, and usually you're back in 30 minutes, and you were gone for two hours. And the person's going to argue with you. No, it's fine. I just started talking to somebody. And uh, so again, these early signs can be difficult to parcel out. 
confusion and familiar situation. So um, a person may usually be very gregarious in a social situation, and you're going to notice they are much quieter or don't even want to go, because some of that may be they're having a hard time kind of following along with the conversation or even recognizing who is this person. Uh, I'm Like, why am I here with these people? I may not even be recognizing who are the people in my social changes. So this leads into personality changes. I gave you that example of my uncle. Problems with gait or walking. So if uh, in some of the dementias, especially Lewy body, you may have more changes around motor functioning. And so that may be more predominant than um, in some of the other things. Or say in Alzheimer's, in Alzheimer's, eventually, the person loses their ability to walk. They're losing their ability to eat. They don't recognize what hunger means. They even maybe forget how to chew, and they're definitely going to forget how to walk. So probably one of the saddest instances I saw is I was called in for a consultation with a gentleman who did not have a clear diagnosis of dementia originally because uh, people were frankly sloppy about what they were observing. And then on top of it, because one service agency could no longer meet his support needs, he was transferred to another service agency. And both the state agency kind of lost track of who was this man. And then the people who agency A transitioning him to agency B didn't do, did a horrible job of communicating who is this man. So I start nosing around and find out that this was a guy who, you know, used to love to sing and dance and had lots of personality, lots of things he was interested in. By the time I came upon the situation, he was in a bed. They were ordering this fantastically expensive wheelchair, which I will debate. I'm not sure that I'm right about that, except that I think once your dementia is that advanced, where are you going? I mean, are we really resetting priorities, or shouldn't he just have a really nice one of those sleeping bed, lounging pop-up thing? Would that have been enough? I don't know. But people, what upset me, you can see I'm so upset about, it, is they had lost who he was. So it's one thing, and the, and the service agency that uh, took over his care were fantastic in terms of he received excellent care. But my criticism of them is that they looked at him as if he was someone who always was in a wheelchair. So we know, we know and support people who have always been in a wheelchair, have never had verbal language, have always had to be fed by somebody, all that, right? The highest level of support. That's who they are. That's who they are. This guy wasn't that. This guy had other things that he brought to the table, and we had really lost that part of who he is. So um, these changes are, you know, can happen either initially or will happen eventually. And then the other one, onset of new seizures. So you can have someone who either never had seizures at all, or we have a lot of people I see in their records who had seizures at one point. Nobody can remember the last time they had a seizure. Many times the neurologist may not take them off of a medication. Uh, because they kind of don't want to upset the apple cart. Um, but you can have a resurgence of seizures because, again, it's the part of the brain is physically being affected by this. This isn't just like a chemical imbalance. This, these are these tendrils that are uh, kind of attaching themselves, you know, to the brain tissue. I'll have, I have a picture that's going to show that. So we're going to go back a minute and in terms of a differential, what we call a differential diagnosis, is it this or is it that? These are all the things that need to be ruled out before a person uh, is diagnosed. I developed, I'm going to pass this around. I didn't make this as your handout, but I can tell you, um, we can send it to you afterwards. This is kind of a checklist that I like providers to use, family members can use it too, to make sure we have checked off all the boxes of this diagnosis, we haven't missed something that could be corrected. Um, so in a person who is very severely dehydrated can, you know, get fuzzy in the brain and start kind of talking stupid and saying different things. 
Malnutrition, where I worry about malnutrition is that people who are more independent and making their own decisions, they could become malnourished. You know, if they're living in the family home, less likely, I think, to happen. If they're living in a group residential uh, setting, I think less likely to happen. In D.C., everybody was on multivitamin. But if you are an, a more independent person and you could really have some nutritional problems if we're not uh, putting the right supports in place. Um, you could have a metabolic disorder like a thyroid deficiency. We talked before about changes in your hearing. Uh, my good friend whose husband is being worked up, the first place she went to was a, um, an ophthalmologist because all of a sudden he couldn't park a car to save his life. And I'm not talking parallel parking. He couldn't get a car in the in the line of a parking lot. And it was like, well, what's that? She thought maybe maybe there was a vision problem, but there was no vision problem, so it could be that. Um, again, what are we going to need? That a person who had been more self-directing, had been more independent, there may come a time where they really cannot be left alone at all. Um, certainly, services like uh, you know, a health-focused day program can be really important um, because the person may need that um, that level of supervision and assistance. I've been very, I've been on the other side of the argument around getting rid of some of the day program sites um, because I do think that let's, I'm just going to be really frank. If you have, if you are a younger parent whose son or daughter is out of school and you need to work, what are you going to do with them? <laughs> Where? What's going to happen? So um, you could have somebody who was being very independent, could be left you know, to their own devices for parts of the day. Dementia is going to change that uh, trajectory for them. So we need to really look at how does the person get the in-home support that they want and that their support team wants for them. Think about doing advanced planning. So that's a whole other topic. I'm happy to come back and volunteer to talk about on end of life planning because I think it's really important and important in someone with dementia that you're doing it early on so that they truly can be part of their planning. Because if you wait too long, they really are not able to make the decisions that they normally would have made um, before the changes to their brain. Um, Again, support to, for the caregivers, all of the things that we've already talked about. It is so important about building that bridge. So um, the, uh, now it's going to, because I often refer people to it, the website that all the, all the, all communities in the United States have funding from the federal government to um, provide you with resources around aging, uh, aging and resource centers. Um, it's interesting, at the federal level, the aging people used to be separate from the DD people. And a few years ago, that group now is under one umbrella because they see that services that people need with developmental disabilities are needed by some older people, and people with developmental disabilities can certainly use some of the generic, what we call the generic services that are in place for adults without developmental disabilities. So there's this really push to think more broadly, and it kind of goes along with what we're trying to get people to think about. Don't just think about, I'm going to pick on service source since some of you are here. Just don't think about having somebody get a service source. Maybe there are some other things during the day that are happening that the person would enjoy just as well, um, that they may need some accommodation, but they don't necessarily have to go to just a place for all people with developmental disabilities attend. Mm -hmm. um, the Alzheimer's Association um, is really uh, helpful, but think about it. We need to get our state protection advocacy on board. Mm -hmm. What do the faith-based organizations have uh, to assist families? Um, I don't know how robust um, that is. Uh, again, it's going to be one more thing for family members to do. Get, get that going, I guess, but it could be. Um, and then looking at, again, the need for respite care and, and potentially a big change. You know, like if you'd always planned that my son is going to live with us um, 
and then this changes and then you really can't. I mean, that happened with my grandmother. My mother was very upset when she had to go into uh, a facility, but she started leaving the house. Um, and then she got kicked out of the day program she was in because she left the day program. And it became dangerous for her uh, to do that. So um, these are, again, really good planning. I think the good thing around people with developmental disabilities, if you're already within a system that is used to annual planning, putting out goals, you already have some supports, you know, you have a bit of a leg up in, in that if they are dementia capable. Okay, so we talked about people with Down syndrome already. We talked about some of the um, other things that could be causing some of the signs of dementia. I think this slide is helpful because it does talk about what is typical aging and symptoms of dementia. Um, so all of us may have some problems. I just, a few minutes ago, was searching for a word, uh, pausing to remember, how am I going to get there? Now that I have GPS, I'm so mm -hmm. spoiled, because I used to like think, okay, I'm getting, like today, I'm going from Vienna to Merrifield. Well, how am I going to do that? I didn't even think. I just pop it in the GPS because mm -hmm. it's going to tell me the quickest way to get there, and that's all I do. So um, we all have some of these things that happen, but again, for the person with dementia, it is um, much more noticeable and has that big impact. So the interpersonal social skills, um, you may have somebody who um, just had really great manners, knew what to say or do or what not to say, and now they're behaving very inappropriately in social situations. And this is where you get some of the, uh, the sexual acting out. Uh, sometimes disrobing uh, can, again, um, they've never done this before. Why are they doing this? Um, if you had a, a youngster disrobing themselves, we'd look at, probably the first thing I'd look at in a youngster is what are sensory issues? Do they have a tag somewhere that they got to just get rid of those pair of pants or that jacket? But in an adult who had never had this problem and knew the, the social strictures of when do you undress, et cetera, and they all of a sudden start doing this, it either is because the part of their brain that you know, governs our emotional reaction has been affected, or sometimes people with Alzheimer's have this tremendous need for fidgeting. And the Alzheimer's Association even sells these what they call fidget desks. So that instead of, and then for men a lot of times, Right? They often wear pants with zippers here. And so people are like, oh my God, John's exposing himself. And it's, well, he's not really mm -hmm. exposing himself for the person that's getting a reaction from people, but that zipper is right there. And so you can fidget you with it. So they actually sell these desks that have all kinds of snaps and buttons and things on it. Um, they talk about doing things like if somebody is doing a lot of fidgeting, you get um, you know, a basket full of socks to match up because it just kind of helps um, the brain kind of discharge that uh, activity. Now we want to be really careful to make sure that, again, for people with intellectual disabilities, there's this concept of diagnostic overshadowing. I heard it years ago in relation to people with mental illness that people with intellectual disabilities weren't getting diagnosed with a mental illness. It was just where well, they have a, you know, they have a severe intellectual disability. Of course they act like that. And there wasn't that recognition of, no, either they've not been taught, they're not getting the right supports, or they have a mental health problem. And so uh, we want to make sure that uh, people aren't, you know, getting that same kind of runaround with the dementia diagnosis. And a lot of times, and when we first started doing this work in D.C., people would say, well, I, I brought them to a neurologist, and the neurologist didn't know what to do. Well, yeah, because you brought them, you, you sent them with somebody who didn't know the person that well. You didn't have any baseline information about what they were like. Um, and the neurologist may have never have been asked to, may have never done this before. I'm going to start passing around the screening tool that we'll be talking about in a bit. Um, so we want to make sure that, again, people with intellectual disabilities aren't being underdiagnosed, or in the case of people with Down syndrome, that automatic expect, well, they have Down syndrome, that this, this must be dementia. Because again, we want to be careful about that. We want it for everybody, we want the standard to be the same. We want the careful diagnosis. We want to rule out those things that could be reversible first. 
Um, so in the medical terms, we call it a differential diagnosis. Um, it is a two-stage process. You're first of all saying these things that we're seeing look like they are dementia in terms of the changes from the person's baseline. And then what is the cause of it? Is it something reversible or is it one of the other types of irreversible dementia? Um, so for you and I, in fact, now, a couple of years ago, I think when you hit, I'm trying to think, six, maybe it is when you hit 65, Medicare now requires physicians to do a screening. And it's actually got some publicity when President Trump had his physical, remember his mm -hmm. physician went out and said, I did this assessment. Well, here's why I disagree. It wasn't an assessment. It was a screening because now Medicare does require, and this is good because they've set a standard that everybody on Medicare is going to get, uh, you know, a certain set of, you know, blood work and this, but they're also going to get this, uh, some type of a mini mental assessment, which is fine because I would say that probably everybody in this room, even if you can't do it today, at some point you could count backwards, you know, by three. But we know for many people with intellectual disabilities, they're not able to do this. And so the screening test that's been developed by the National Task Group on Dementia, what it does is it looks at the person's baseline in terms of what are they able to do. Um, so this is just going through what would you do first. We always want to start with the history and physical to see what's happening with the person and making sure, uh, and this goes back to our advocacy that people really do need a regular source of care. So going into uh, and I love the urgent cares, but going into an urgent care for your primary care is not great because um, you really do want someone who knows you over time. And I know that, you know, in today's practices, if you go in, you know, you're going to see somebody different maybe than your regular physician. But usually, if uh, you go and make your appointment ahead of time for your annual physical, you can get the appointment with that, you know, with Dr. Smith. I'm going to see Dr. Smith because I made my appointment six months ahead of time. So that is really important. Um, there are certain lab tests. All these lab tests should be done uh, if there is a suspicion. You've seen changes in their behavior. Um, you've done this checklist that we're going to talk about in a minute. All these things should be done because they can, again, rule out potentially reversible causes. And then at some point, and this could be the primary care physician who does it, or they may at this point hunt it over to a neurologist to do some type of a scan. Because you are looking for a possibility of a tumor. A tumor could cause uh, dementia. Um, so you want to make sure that there's nothing there that is uh, reversible. Any questions to this point? Um, so again, we want to rule out the treatable conditions, and the National Task Group on Dementia is really pushing for early diagnosis because this is going to be key to maintaining a good quality of life so that we're not like that poor gentleman I described. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, he's in a different group home. His authorized representative signed a consent for him to have a gastric tube feeding, and the poor fellow is just literally kind of melting away in terms of his weight, developing contractures. Um, his agency even took him on a vacation and, you know, he was, he, I don't know what he benefited from that. Again, the second agency did a wonderful job with him, but we were, he was robbed of that kind of planning and for him to be able to say what he wanted to do. So this, uh, you have this in your handout. These are the various types of dementias, the four types that we talked about. And while they have some uh, commonality among them, you'll see that you know Alzheimer's has the memory, the visual spatial problems, and language disturbances. Frontotemporal, you're going to see more of the personality changes, visual hallucinations, and Lewy body as a predominant feature. And then, of course, vascular dementia is an abrupt onset, right? You have a stroke. Um, maybe you didn't get the treatment that you could have had because somebody, I don't know, you were alone and 
too many hours had passed to get that anticoagulant that you could get. It certainly is an abrupt change in um, your functioning. This is a slide that I think is, I have used it as a very helpful way to help decision makers understand what is going on. You're not going back. So the, on the right, you have the brain of someone with advanced Alzheimer's. So you can see it is visibly shrunken. Um, so it really does kind of, I think, helps me understand this is why we say it's irreversible because the, um, you know, you're operating with kind of a, a half of a brain. So um, it is something that is a terminal illness. And when I talk with people, I do talk with them about, you know, dementia is, uh, irreversible dementia is a terminal illness. You're not going to get better. We can maintain a really good quality of life to a certain point, uh, but then we're going to go beyond that. And last year I had the, really a privilege of working with a family. Uh, this man lived with his sister and brother-in-law uh, in, in a very modest apartment in D.C. And they, he did have a diagnosis of dementia, but they didn't they were trying to figure out what does this mean for us. And it turns out it was a family of like, I think, eight siblings. And so aside from the sister he lived with, two or three of the siblings came to the apartment and we had another two on a conference call. And I kind of did a little mini class on dementia for them to first of all understand this is what we're talking about. Um, have them tell me, where do you see your brother in the progression of this? And now what do we do in terms of, of planning um, for him? So um, it was, you know, again, that is going to help maintain the quality of life that maybe he would have wanted for himself and the siblings. They got to talk about the sister he was living with wanted him to continue to live with her. They were already had to put a lock on this, the door up here so he wouldn't leave uh, at night. One of her brothers was worried, this is too much. How are you going to do this? Um, but at that point, you know, she, she was really adamant about that. I wanted to make sure she understood what resources were available. Should she change her mind? Because a lot of these things that get into end of life planning, we can change our mind. We don't. We are not going to be held to it. Well, you know, today in mid-April 2018, you said you were doing such such and such. We're going to have to do it. It, it can always, you know, it can always be changed. Again, we talked already about some common conditions. Um, besides dementia, there is something called delirium that um, can happen uh, with a high fever. It can happen for some people with urinary tract infections. Older people with urinary tract infections have all kinds of serious problems. But one of the other things that has to be ruled out is depression because you can see a personality change with depression, and so sometimes the, you know, the primary care physician may try to may try a trial of an antidepressant to see if that helps things. Because remember that Albert, when we first started talking, uh, Albert, in that year's time, his physician may have wanted, if he wasn't already on an antidepressant, try a trial of an antidepressant. If it improves your mood, improves your functioning, well then, that's diagnostic of depression. Again, depression is similar to dementia in that uh, now there is a checklist um, that I can give you a web page that uh, will show you, uh, help you to make that diagnosis, help the physician to make that diagnosis in people with intellectual disabilities. So um, sometimes, again, depending on how people are describing it, and I think sometimes staff members may sometimes describe things very differently depending on, you know, their background, how much education they've had around some things. They really have to be a detective to piece things out. Um, so again, these are all the aspects of our functional ability affected by irreversible dementia. And reasoning and judgment, you know, that's that thing around, um, there's actually, I think, very interesting story about the former um, Sandra Day O'Connor. Her husband has dementia, I think advanced dementia. He's in a facility. She has made this public that he now he has a girlfriend in that facility. He no longer remembers that they are married. He doesn't know who she is at all. 
and he has a, uh, a close relationship with another woman in this facility. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's one where I'm not, I actually wouldn't call that, I call that more a memory problem than reasoning and judgment, um, because he apparently loves this woman, and Sandra Day O'Connor has embraced this as, this is who my husband is now. Um, people who are uh, becoming maybe hypersexualized may be more around the reasoning and judgment, um, you know, taking risks that they normally wouldn't take, and that, and that could be dangerous for them. Again, the ability to sequence tasks certainly uh, has a lot to do with a person's ability to dress themselves, to prepare meals, to do some of the things that they had done before. This, I think, is an important slide because it does go through what you see in the stages. So that family I talked about that I worked with, I had them take a look at this. Where do you see your brother? So that they could see he was at a middle stage. He was already having uh, trouble with his, ADA, his activities of daily living, sleeping problems, recognizing some people. The late stage, this is what's going to come. This is the inevitability of irreversible dementia. So that we do, ha I believe it's really important to introduce this to people, that this is what we're going to be talking about so that, uh, again, I wouldn't do it all in one day or one session, right? But then I want you to take this home and think about this. I want you to think about, and we'll talk about what are we going to do when, uh, you know, someone with a loss of bladder and bowel control, if they're cared for at home, <coughs> aging parents who had always wanted to take care of their son or daughter, I don't want other people, I'm afraid I hear, I hear about abuse, all this other stuff, but maybe now, oh my God, I can't, I can't do it because of my back. I can't do it because I'm just not strong enough to. Uh, I mean, my son is over, over 300 pounds. And how I, what I'm in him. Mm. And he has horrible health habits. And when I get really mad at him, I'm like, you're going in the nursing home because I won't be able to take care of you. Um, so we know that some of these things are coming. And any of them could be kind of a deal breaker in terms of the ability to be cared for at home. What happens with mobility if you're in a house with steps? Um, I'm, I'm really curious around um, situations with um, like the assisted living where, that you can go in when you're a certain age. Continuing care. Continuing care. Yeah. And can you bring your son and daughter with you? I, so I was in Michigan recently with my daughter who just had a baby, and I saw some advertisement on TV. And so I contacted them, and you know, my daughter and husband were laughing at me a little bit. What are you doing that for? And I'm like, I'm just curious. Like, I think Paul would do well if he came, you know, like at some point, we have to force it, we have to move there, and then he'll come with us, and then people will get to know him, and I think he could do well in that environment. But then I found out this place, you had to be, um, everybody in the family had to be 55. That was it. I felt like I could have moved Paul in before he was 55, but I'm like, oh, I'm doing the math. I don't know that I'm going to live that long, so I don't know that I should put all my eggs in that cart. <laughs> but that could be uh, if you have your son or daughter is o over 55, and they're half set. You know, it could be we've got to start not thinking of it prematurely, but once you get the diagnosis, you need to think about these things because this progression is going to happen. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the eating thing. Uh, vascular dementia tends to have, um, instead of that kind of slow slower or gradual deterioration, uh, the person actually kind of gets some um, point for their plateauing, which is a minor distinction. So uh, for, for the family members and even for people who are here as paid staff, our advocacy can never stop. It can never stop. We can't just kind of be complacent. I've just been a little bit of a maniac about this. Here. Um, we just have to always keep making things better. Um, so it's really important. And I love here, it talks about healthcare is an art, not a science. And in my project that we were, that I worked for the last 12 years at Georgetown, it was all around improving healthcare access and quality in the University of Columbia. And I worked with a physician, lovely family physician, smart as all get out. But so many times I would say, Ken, this is about the art 
about the science and how you do a procedure or what do these numbers mean. It gets to be about talking with people, giving people time. I'm a big one around, you know, people come into an intensive care unit, all of a sudden the docs want, we want these, you know, we want to know, do you want to proceed with this and that and everything. Everybody's like this, could you have like 24, 48 hours? Like, is that going to break the bank on anybody? You know, that's the odd part of it. And I certainly think around, you know, once the diagnosis is made, in fact, we already, they're now saying that, and there's, there's some studies ongoing, trying to figure out when does the irreversible dementia start. And they're thinking now that it's probably 15 years before we first recognize the symptoms. And of course, that's going to be important if we can start recognizing it earlier in case down the road we do find some treatment um, for it. So um, we really have to bring our best self forward. And it's so important because many people with uh, intellectual disabilities are frustrated in their ability to self-advocate. Not because they can't say it, people don't listen to them. It's around a respect issue of, you know, you hear, um, we did a video a couple of years ago with people with intellectual disabilities talking about their approaches to physicians. We did it with the med students uh, at Georgetown. And their big number one issue is the doctor is always talking to the staff member. I can talk for myself. Ask me. Don't, this whole woman goes, don't look in that book. Talk to me. I can tell you why I'm here and what I need. So they are behind the eight ball on that because of just uh, biases in the, in the community. And there's ageism uh, that people have a sense of, well, you're older now. But so I, had, I was involved a couple of years ago in a situation where a young man with cerebral palsy was hospitalized because he had um, a blockage in his intestine uh, from a fecal impaction. He lived at home with his mother, who had some support needs of her own. Um, he had never been in the hospital before, and they cured him of his constipation, and he was ready to go home. But before he went home, the hospital people made a referral for hospice. So we had a nurse who followed everybody in the hospitalizations, and she came back to the office. She's like, oh. I'm like, okay, this is going to be a self-correcting problem because they're going to make that referral to hospice. We'll deal with the hospital later. But the hospice will not accept him because he doesn't meet criteria for hospice. Well, guess what? The hospice accepted him. So that got into this whole thing. We actually did uh, make an attempt to go to court for an emergency temporary guardianship because his mother was his guardian and we wanted a temporary guardianship to kind of stop this nonsense and give us a chance to figure out what's going on. I bring this up, this guy didn't have dementia, but I bring it up because the judge, now it wasn't the regular judge who hears these issues, this is the problem with the emergency guardianships you get. This judge uh, ruled against a temporary guardianship and he said, well, you know, you got to die of something. I mean, I was like a maniac in the courtroom because uh, what kind of attitude is that? I mean, that is ageism. Like I, and I have, I was really even in an uncomfortable space for myself because many times I am working with people and trying to advocate for, um, you know, looking at quality of life. And so many times I've said to people, it is ethically okay if you decide against further treatment. Look what Barbara Bush just did, right? She decided, I'm going, I'm not going to go to the hospital anymore, I'm going to have palliative care. It's okay to do that, to come to that decision at some point. Um, this judge was clearly prejudiced uh, because even though we had a witness come in from um, you know, actually the University of Rochester by telephone who was expert in treating people with cerebral palsy, uh, the judge listened to a physician at this university hospital that will remain nameless and, and said that because this person was um, the age of this person, he said people with cerebral palsy only live to 47, which isn't true, and this guy was nearing 47, so he was already at, now I was a flunked undergrad 
for coming up with that reasoning because even though, I forget now, what is the average age is maybe 72, 75 for white women. I don't think it's much. That doesn't mean when I get to be 75, <laughs> I'm not going to have something that's perfectly treatable. Now, in my personal opinion, if I had dementia, I will be thinking twice about what surgery I have or whatever. But, but that, that was an express example of really, um, you know, ableism uh, at work. So it is, I say that because it's alive and well, and we do have to be, uh, you know, careful about that. Um, and we'd already talked about the diagnostic overshadowing. Can you talk to look? Sorry. All right. Just to say here that, um, and I will, in, in the interest of disclosure, I am a person who has strong faith in medication. I see what, what medications are able to do, different psychotropic antidepressant medications have made a tremendous difference in my son's life, tremendous. So I'm very, I am biased about that. Um, but we do have to be careful because a lifetime use of the medication, depending on the status of your liver, your ability to metabolize, things can change. Um, and things can change in the person. I mean, I, sometimes when I look at records and it's an elderly person with an intellectual disability, they're carrying the crap diagnosis of intermittent explosive disorder, and they're on some medication, and you're like, and then they're actually declining because their health is declining. And I'm like, now sometimes you run across the person who they are feisty up until the very end, uh, feisty as can be. But what I think we sometimes fail to look at has this person changed, and maybe they don't need all of the medications that they're on. Um, and then somebody may even impose upon themselves decreased fluid intake because now I don't want to have to go to the bathroom, I don't want to have an accident, um, and fluid intake is really important in terms of the metabolism of medication. So we certainly do need a close look at people. And I'm a big proponent of um, at some point maybe switching to somebody who does have a geriatric practice. Um, sometimes it's hard to get uh, in to see those folks, but remember gerontologists, again, that specialist, so at some point maybe your in regular internist isn't the best person. Um, so medications certainly have lots of benefits, but we have to be really careful that as part of just what are we looking at, uh, you know, are we taking into consideration the role of the side effects of medications? I'm going to keep going on this. So um, get to the diagnostic instrument. So again, the difference between screening and diagnosis, there isn't um, a a really diagnostic test. Now here this gives an example that if you have advanced shrinkage, it's going to show up on an MRI, but your MRI may be negative also in, in the diagnostic phase. Uh, but a screen is something that isn't going to make a diagnosis, so it's, I think the screening instrument is working its way around. It's not going to make a diagnosis, but what's so important is that it's going to bring such great information to the primary care physician and the neurologist about who is this person, um, no matter what their you know, baseline abilities are. So screening is really important um, because we've already talked about this. We can be really proactive about it, um, and as well as if it really is a treatable condition, like a person needs a new pair of eyeglasses or a different kind of prescription. So when I want to get into the screening tool. This is available online, so you can, and the only criteria for being able to administer this is that um, it's kind of like the support intensity scale. You have to know the person for six months. And I always suggest that if you're going to do a screening tool, it's really best to bring together a group of people um, who know the person best and who see them at different parts of the day. So if you're in a service organization, you're in a residential um, home, um, don't forget that night staff because they see the person one way, right? Because the person may have some confusion problems in the day, but the night staff are really dealing with what's happening, you know, uh, in the middle of the night. Um, the National Task Group talks about, all right, screening people down syndrome at the age of 40. They're also pushing to have anyone else to be screened automatically at 50. Other recommendations 
for people's ID will say only screen them if there is, uh, you see a change of something. Um, again, that would be up to, if you're a service organization, what does your policy want to do? I know why the NTG does this, because they are really in this push of identifying people as early as possible and trying to understand what can we see early on um, and how early can we make a diagnosis. Um, but in DC, we said it was only if there was a change. Um, so it has, the first couple of pages have some basic information, demographic information about the person. And then the neat thing is, let me see if it, yeah, it goes on these different domains. And what it'll say, for example, is um, John can dress himself. Uh, John dresses himself. John always dressed himself. Or John has never been able to dress himself. Or John was able to dress himself, but now he's having trouble. So it gives this grid, this real baseline to help you understand who is John. So um, if John never had a set of five or six <coughs> abilities, um, we're not going to get them now. <laughs> it kind of is too late for that. He's probably not going to gain those abilities now. But how has it changed? <coughs> so it really does help the, the neurologist, again, understand who is the person in front of them and what were they capable of in their, you know, just a few months ago or a year or two ago, and how do they look now so that they can, it doesn't give a score, it just gives a picture of this person. And certainly you can then go into the appointment, I mean, this is definitely an appointment that someone needs a good advocate with, any of us would, uh, to go in with, this is who the person is, and um, this is what we're seeing now, okay? Any questions about that? Yes. And then, like, uh, six months or a year later, screen again if you're just at the beginning? Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're, uh, let's say that you get all these tests done, everything is fine. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you kind of uh, accommodate. You know, sometimes I think as a parent, I'm going to say I've had the experience where I really understand that frog in the hot water. Because you just get so used to this sometimes crazy things you do to accommodate your family member that you don't even notice. Oh my God, what the heck am I doing? Oh yeah, Paul's not doing this anymore, but what am I doing? I'm doing 20 different things to try to support him to be safe, okay? So, um, so you certainly can repeat this as often as you want. And I would suggest to people that even, especially in, in a service provision situation, uh, it would certainly be good to do it once a year just so that you can track where the person's going and have that better understanding of, you know, communication because of, because of staff turnover. What if the person had to go to a different service agency? You have all those things. I think it makes a nice picture. And, it's, you know, it's not that difficult to do, especially if you know the person well. Um, so the, the screening even, you know, talks about health conditions. It is really bringing into the physician a really nice summary of who this person is. Now, uh, again, usually um, I have to say that at the Georgetown Memory Disorder Clinic, I tried advocating when I was there. I thought they should just embrace my idea <laughs> to become a site where people with developmental disabilities, they're going to go there because they're going to know what's going on. I was going to work with them around it, and maybe there would even be some research grants we could go after. I was all revved up, and I couldn't get to first base, <laughs> and they were not interested. And so you certainly could go to some of them, and, and a lot of them to their, I guess, one excuse. I wasn't a whole bit behind it, but was that, well, their um, research grants do uh, direct a lot of what the services that they do. You, you fit a research protocol. And this is where people with developmental disabilities never go into those research protocols because they have a developmental disability. And that's, a, that's an intervening variable that nobody wants in the research project. I thought it would have been a great idea to get something going, and we probably could have found some money for that. I had to retire and let that one go. But, um, so some of the specialty centers may not accept uh, a person into their, into their research protocol. 
Um, and again, I think there has to be a lot of education. Um, I think Dr. Petalicchio at GW retired a couple of years ago. He was fantastic in terms of understanding the needs of people with intellectual disabilities. But I talked with him a few years ago because I was, well, we actually did bring in one of the neurologists who uh, de helped develop this tool and we brought him in to do a teaching session, the Grand Rounds at Georgetown. And I was trying to get, like, let all the neurologists in the city let them know about this and come in. And Dr. Pavlicki didn't know anything about all of this stuff. And he serves a lot of people with intellectual disabilities and has for many years. So if you do find your play, yourself in a position to be bringing someone forward, you're going to need some good advocacy. Now, if there's somebody here who has worked with a neurologist or primary care physician, does anyone have any different experience, like on the positive side? I just find that you have to bring them up to speed. And a lot of times you're familiar with things that they aren't familiar right. with. Yeah. And I haven't found any situation that turns it up. Yeah. And like I said, and I'm not a We're now going to Georgetown. In the memory clinic or the? No, in the clinic. epilepsy center. Oh, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. But I've been to Fairfax as well, but I'm just. I tried to get the, <laughs> I tried to get Virginia to do what they were doing in D.C. with this kind of project where we had people dedicated to educating physicians and nurses and all this. We did all kinds of stuff when um, I directed that project for 12 years. That helped bring people along. And, or we could be an advocate. We could be, like, when this guy was put in hospice for, we mobilized and got things changed, and they weren't interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, too bad, because I think it's needed. Pennsylvania has a system like that, where in every region of the state, there is this little group of health professionals who know people with developmental disabilities, they help set standards, they help enforce standards, you know, through education, a lot of education, resource development. It, it's like anything else, you know, it's like, you know, uh, all the tech companies, right, who, who are making mm -hmm. millions and billions of dollars, whatever. They never stop improving. So, but you know, in human services, because we're not pretty low profit margin, as I understand, we're not, you know, we're not doing it. So that will never, probably never change for a long time. Um, so we need. To, that's discouraging. Yeah, it, it, I mean it is. When I cleaned, don't get me going. When I cleaned out my office, I had like 30 years of stuff in my office. I'm like, oh my God, we're still talking about the same darn things that we talked about when I first started this work, but we have to keep going. We, you know, we do know some things. Like, we weren't even talking about dementia and pe because people weren't even living long enough to even develop uh, dementia, or we slapped them in with some Thorazine and some other medications, and, you know, and that was the end of that. So th there are good things, um, and, and I do think that, again, I think this screening tool is a great way to um, help bring that information together. And here we said we talked about knowing the person for a minimum of six months. And um, again, if you're kind of chairing uh, this group, uh, you want to make sure that uh, staff are being as open and honest as they can be, that they're not going to try to hide something so because they don't want to hurt your feelings as the parent. You know, it'd probably be good to kind of like set the stage on, you know, what we're talking about. We're not here to make a diagnosis. We're just here to figure out what is going on. Um, and don't make judgments about, you know, what people are saying is their observation. Um, again, we want to make sure that you're talking to as many people as you know, uh, putting together the medical record to really find it out and understand who is this, who is this person. Oh, the videotape, I think this is really interesting, of course, with all this you know, recent talk about privacy and what are we doing. So we do have a lot of video available about people. And um, there are some people advocating for um, taking a video of a person at their annual meeting. Um, and there's probably, all, I'm sure, all kinds of privacy headaches and storage and all kinds of things. But as family members, we can do that. <coughs> Just kind of, you know, get the person to say a few things, get a picture of them moving around, so that you do have, you know, some baseline that you can then see if there's some changes. And um, 
I think it, you know, it sounds like a good idea. Like I said, I know in the service sector it's a whole other set of uh, headaches, but you know, we've had headaches before. Um, <laughs> Um, this is what I was talking of before. It's the, right. the people who pay for Medicare um, didn't, wouldn't give a specific tool to use. So, uh, however, in a person with an intellectual disability, this is the tool that you would, you know, I would highly recommend using. Um, again, is there conflicting information? You know, there, there can be, but again, you do the best you can. And, uh, for a professional, if you say, I don't know about this period or there's some conflicting information, you just say that because, again, this is going to be a process in getting to the diagnosis. Um, so you're going to collect all your information. Most physicians are going to appreciate uh, having this. They may have to have a second appointment. Uh, I think usually if someone uh, comes in and, and the physician sees that they are dealing with a possible diagnosis of dementia, you're probably going to have to go, go back again. It's not going to be just a one-time thing. Um, and, you know, again, you're talking about what are the next steps here. So uh, these are the steps. There's that screening that you do first. Then there's a formal assessment. And people with intellectual disabilities, uh, they may have a neuropsychiatric exam. There are certainly practitioners who conduct neuropsychiatric exams in people with intellectual disabilities the whole scanning, CT, MRI, and then you're going to either get, the, a lot of this will also depend on the neurologist. You might start out with a possible or probable until such time some things are going, you know, going on uh, that make it more definitive. And, and the only real definitive is, of course, on autopsy or unless a scan is done when the person is so advanced. But usually, at the time the person is that advanced, the physician is probably not going to recommend a scan because for what purpose? At that point, you've probably figured, you know, they figured it out. Uh, and someone is given a diagnosis. So the diagnosis is important to, to arrive at at some point. So we've talked again about what are the, you know, the problems that we face in, with the healthcare providers. And then what does it mean? So first of all, you at least now know what you're doing. So, case of my poor friend, it was like, it's her, it wasn't me. Because then I thought that maybe I was having some kind of memory problem. It doesn't change the person, but again, I think there is some comfort at least in understanding now what's going on and now how are we going to move forward. Uh, not forgetting all the things that we always talk about in developmental disabilities, person-centered planning, uh, keeping the person as independent as possible, respecting the dignity and worth of the person, these things don't change uh, at all. And it may give us some access to some uh, resources that we didn't have before the diagnosis was made. Um, so we want to, again, the, the individual service plan should look to maintain function, although this is where that pivot comes in. Uh, this is not going to be the time for, and I don't know what the plans look like here, but you know I've seen plans that are really. Uh, oh God, there's one I saw this weekend that I actually wrote it down. What did they say? The person was going to maintain motor skills. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. But um, so we have some plans that are not written so well. But we also, if somebody has been on a plan to learn how to load the dishwasher for umpteen years. Not that that would ever happen here in Fairfax County, but if they were on that plan for up 10 years, and now we have a diagnosis of dementia, it's time to give up the ghost on the dishwasher loading because they're not going to be able to learn new things. So that's that pivot I was talking about. They're not going to be able to learn. When we talk about dementia-capable environments, it's a frustration-free environment. And that's going to mean different things for different people, right? So you just remember the goal is to reduce the frustration factor on the part of the person affected with irreversible dementia. Um, not on this, well, it also, it'll bleed into the staff too. We want to reduce their anxiety. So there are a lot of things that we can do environmentally. I'm not saying that we jump to medication, but at some point you may need to. Once all the environmental things didn't work, so um, I was doing some education in a particular uh, home 
in uh, Maryland, and um, it wasn't until the second time I was there with staff that they admitted that um, what they were doing was not helpful. So the nurse who had brought me in was all proud because she was using some kind of herbal tea in the evening and or maybe serotonin capsules or something, and she thought things were great. And the staff were like, not only was he awake, that wouldn't have been that would have been a problem. He was making so much noise at night, and they were in an apartment, and their neighbors from uh, from uh, downstairs were coming upstairs, the neighbors from upstairs were coming downstairs, because he was keeping everybody in the apartment awake, and was at risk of losing his lease, because you can lose your lease if you make noise in the middle of the night. You can't, you kind of can't do that. And so he was somebody that it was really time to start looking at a medication to help him so that he could stay with the guys. He'd lived with these guys for a long time. And, and the staff, I mean, the staff were so upset about the changes that they were seeing. So it, did, it helped them to understand what was going on. But it was also a great example that sometimes you have to keep working with the staff because they may see that as something they're not doing right or sometimes um, the staff may just think like, well, I've got to listen to this person because they're the boss, even if they're being, I don't know, ridiculous or ineffective. They may not speak out against that. So you have to really be an investigator here and, and fi figure this out. Uh, what can we do to decrease caregiver stress? So in this other home, the staff was upset because uh, this guy would always take their things. He would take their wallets. So I'm like, well, guess what? <laughs> so when you come to work, this is your work site now here, you're going to take your wallet and you're going to lock it up. And you're either going to leave it in your car or you're going to lock it up. This is a simple one to do. And I, I tend to have a little less. Now, that night staff, I really felt for them. But sometimes I have less, I don't know, patience, if that's the right word, for the paid staff, because you get to go home. You're there for eight, maybe 12 hours. You get to go home. You have your life. I really worry about family members who are there 24-7, because then where is their relief going to come from? And maybe we need kind of permission giving. It's okay to think about a different placement. It's okay, like the sister who was adamant she was going to care for her brother. I was just like, I just want to give you permission. I want you to know who to call if it's getting to be too much. And, and that's where we have to let people then come to their own decisions. And we want to support whatever skills they have. So you know, um, in dressing. Well, maybe they don't put on the matching clothes anymore. I know monitors, that used to be a big thing about, oh, things have to match, things have to look nice. Of course, now in fashion, when I opened a little InStyle magazine, nothing matches anyway. Um, but that is probably less important. Uh, whose problem is it? We're going to get to that in a minute. So we want to have things that are failure-free. And um, this is probably, once a person has been diagnosed, it's not the time to introduce them to new, different, wonderful. I know, again, people with disabilities have had kind of a lifetime of not getting those opportunities, and so we always want to push the envelope on new, different, wonderful. But new, different, wonderful may not be helpful. So, like, maybe they're not going to go on vacation. Maybe they always like going on vacation, and if they really still like going, to the same place they always went. That's really great, but maybe they don't anymore. You have to really look at reducing the frustration. Um, look at this first bullet, limiting choices. That's almost like against the, you know, our that core values and principles, right? Choice, 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 choice. We want to have choices. But if people are making dangerous choices or their thinking ability. now. You need to kind of slow it down. So, um, and this is true for a lot of people with intellectual disabilities without dementia, but certainly once the dementia is set in, you want, you may have to give the person a little time to be able to make a response to what you're saying. Uh, or limiting, limiting choices, that they're not going to be able to just go to their closet and pick out anything, because then maybe they're going to pick out the summer shorts when it's, you know, wind chill zero degrees. And so you may have to um, make some modifications there. Hand over hand skill. Uh, maybe the person did something themselves before. They may need you know, their food cut up. They may need um, uh, 
kind of a plate that, um, and a placemat that helps them see more clearly where the food is. They may have to do a lot of that. Um, a person may not welcome hand over hand. Uh, that may be seen as intrusive. But again, it really is going to take the team really doing a lot of figuring out what's going on, breaking steps down. This one on positive language, this was something that was new to me until I took the training with the National Task Group. Um, I mean, I think we like to think of ourselves as doing positive body language, but like right, I, I have been so awful to you because I'm behind you, I'm standing kind of close to you. They have found that for people with dementia, having someone stand like this over them can be seen as very threatening. And so sometimes some of the reaction you're getting is from this body language stuff, and we really need to teach staff. And, and you know, I know our direct support staff have a lot to do, and it may just be, uh, I don't want to be ageism, but just kind of young, talking back, doing all the things that we have to do. We have to really help people slow things down and sit down, and by being at eye level, they have found that that is a really, really effective strategy, a highly effective strategy. So when you're supervising your staff, uh, you want to, you know, not only teach them that, but then supervise them and make sure that they're doing that. Distracting is another one. So when I took this course, I took it with another nurse from my center. She had the hardest time with the distracting part. Well, you're just lying to the person. You shouldn't lie to the person. It is so effective. And with my own friend, we took her to the beach with us last fall. And one night, she was seeing other people in the house. And what's the first thing I did? No, yeah, there's somebody else here. I start like, you know, I wasn't argumentative, but I was countering what she said. And then I had to be like, hold on, stop. Wait a minute, think. And we did things like the next day, we did much more physical activity because I think she was tired. Come 4 o'clock, I put all the lights on in the house so that I wouldn't have a problem with sundowning. And um, that night I did show her, the three of us who were in the house with her, that didn't help. She was convinced there was just somebody that I couldn't see. She, just, you know, kind of, she did get over that. But we were able to prevent it, I think, in subsequent days because we did, we toned down our activity schedule a little bit. Um, we're going to have some, again, focus on abilities. Um, and I think this is really important for us to understand and to get across to staff. They don't see the world the way we did. My friend saw somebody else there at the house. And
So people will forget people, and uh, there can be that, what we would call emotional mobility. So these are, I'm going to go quickly through some things about um, 